All right. We know this one. So we have Vivek Anand. <laughs> he is the baby of this panel. He's 24. He is the director for outreach for the Inter University LGBT Network. He's a student in James Cook, and I think no, 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 right? Okay. <laughs> Next we have Angela Lau. He, she is the PR expert at Salesforce. She's also a personal friend of Asian Narratives, so help us a lot. And she's also the co-VP for the APAC Outreach. Outreach at Outforce, I mean, sorry. Outforce, sorry about that. So Outforce are groups, employees who are uh, allies of LGBT for gender and sexual identities uh, empowerment, right? Correct, right, exactly. Next, we, next, enlightening us, and to remind us that we do not have to choose between faith and our own sexual and gender identity. We have executive pastor of Free Community Church, Colin. <laughs> only LGBT affirming church. So, last year, me and my co-founders at SG Narratives created a series of LGBTQ videos. I think you saw like a trailer over there. And in that video, we actually discussed this question which Yang Pa answered. If 377 is repealed today, what do you foresee will happen? So that question was created by one of my best friends, Shakir, that is hugging someone. Uh, <laughs> so that question, forces us to be in a future mindset, an equality mindset. As a person of minority, I'm like Malay, Muslim, gay, imagining a, a future of equality is extremely hard because I've never experienced equality. So by framing that question that way, we are forced to encounter our own biases and inequalities. Of course, I have to acknowledge one of our great inspiration for the book is by Thieu Yen, her book, this is, what, this is What Inequality Looks Like, inspired by that. The book clarified the way we frame the questions about inequality and equality. By framing questions in certain ways, we actually are forced to look at solutions and answers. It shapes the way we look at solutions and answers. Just as asking what inequality looks like leads to uncomfortable truths about our society, we believe asking what equality looks like will guide us to refuse inequality. So let us start. The first question that started it all. If 377A is rebuilt today, let's imagine that, what do you foresee will happen? So Pastor Pauline, we'll start with you. Do they, do they, do they walk the talk? 
and do the company share the same kind of beliefs as you, for example? So if, let's say, you're working for a company, a, a tech company, that has been accused of uh, gender discrimination on paper, like if, if, a, if a company, for example, gives you like ping pong table in the office, they cater your lunch, um, but they systematically um, pay their female employees less than their male employees, would you work for a company like that? So I think when, when, when the future comes, when 377A is repealed, um, that can only be that can only be good for everyone, not just for the corporates. The schools get to get to talk about it, um, and the education side of things have to start from a young age, where um, your primary school, your secondary school, and in your university, these kind of conversations can open. And from there, when these people enter the workforce they know what to expect and they can have that kind of conversations with companies. Right now, I don't think anybody, when you go for interviews, you don't go and be like, is your company welcoming for LGBTQ? Is your company, um, do, you, do, do, you have a, do you have a positive culture where you are reaffirming um, people like me, people like us? Um, so when that happens, it can only happen from the ground up and then all of us are empowered to question the people. Am I gonna when you when you go interview, when a female engineer go interview for a tech company, you wanna be like, am I gonna be paid equally as my male counterpart? Um, are people asking for that right now? No, now none of us are asking for that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, with, with without saying too much about what Salesforce does, but yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. So we know that Trade Seven Seven A is a symbolic law in the sense that the government is not enforcing it, but it actually does not do anything much in the sense that it just criminalizes sex between men. It's not just, but it criminalizes sex between men. But even if you repeal 377A, there's a lot of other equalities, other rights that we do not have. So we're like, as the youngest African on this panel, <laughs> what do you think our focus should be? If 377A is repealed today, today the Prime Minister is giving a national day rally, imagine he says, let's repeal 377A. What do you think advocates should focus on after that? Hashtag no pressure. Um, <laughs> I guess um, the most important thing would be education, right? Because um, all issues always start with lack of education, ignorance and things like that. So if good education is enforced after that, I think a lot of issues will be resolved naturally. As she said, yeah, I know, open the conversation school, educating it from a young age will affect students. Because even now in the uni, when I'm talking to my friends, they're like, oh, I want to go to overseas uni because I know with my lifestyle I can't settle in Singapore. So if I go to an overseas university, get an internship there, I can settle there in the future. So that's why I want to leave and things like that. So education, this form of acceptance and things like that will retain, I hope, more Singaporeans in Singapore because most of them go out because they find living here is not possible, right? So, um, yeah, I think education and um, Acceptance is the main key point. So, another question about the Do you think, so there's an argument that says, the, the argument is very common among the, the I mean, officials that says that if they do rebuild, the only reason they're keeping 377A is because they do not want to polarize society. Let's for once, let's just entertain that idea that we will polarize and divide society. Do you think, for the sake of equality, that repealing 377A is worth the risk? of dividing this country. Maybe one of you, maybe Pauline will think. I think society is a little bit polarized around that issue. The question is just whether the conversation is taking place on a public level and on an equal level, or is it taking place at a level where, you know, we are at a disadvantage as LGBTQ people because there's this whole thing hanging over us, right? There's this cloud hanging over us. Like, Potential criminal, but not actually criminal, not potential criminal. We just, we just are not enforceable, you know. And, and it, it is not an equal ground for for dialogue, for conversation. It is not fair, right? And so we are already polarized as a society over this issue. What we need is that we need a fair playing ground, and we need real dialogues happening, right? And to do that, it has to come up into the surface. 
And then it needs to be open, it needs to be safe for anybody taking part in that dialogue. So yes, will it cause um, people to then explode around it? I think so. You know, I think definitely there will be lots of reactions, you know, people are going to feel uncomfortable. I think discomfort needs to take, take place um, before we can even get to a place where we can even say we're having real conversations here. Right. So, so, yes, it will cause lots of reactions. Definitely worth it because we need it. Yeah. And it's something that we all have to kind of ride through together as a society. Ride through that discomfort, hold it space so that we can have real conversations around this issue. So change is uncomfortable. I work for a tech company and a lot of the times when we are when we are advising um, our customers when they're going through digital transformation, when you when you're all using uh, Excel spreadsheets and all that, and we're like, no, you have to go to the cloud and you have to transform. Um, that requires a lot of discomfort. Like you have to disrupt your entire organization. You have to change from the ground up the way you work, the way you think, and you have to rewire everything. And then you can transform, and then you can become better, and then you can innovate. It's the same thing with equality. You have to disrupt yourselves. You have to be, if you want to grow, all of us have gone through puberty. When we, when we discover boobs, when you discover hair in places, you're like, oh my god, there's hair there. When you, when you want to grow and you want to change, change is uncomfortable, but it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. And we have to have the same, the Singapore government needs to have the same kind of mindset when they're, when they're trying to transform Singapore into a smart nation. That we are also using the same kind of mindset to rewire the way we think about equality. When we really live the values that we speak about in our pledge that all of our children speak every morning in school. So. So it, uh, we just recently finished Ping Dong, and at the end of the whole Ping Dong, it reminded us that we are ready. Ping Dong said that to the country, to the government, to everyone. The, and I think it was Mugan Shagal who have sent out a, a public letter to the Prime Ministers uh, telling them, outlining in the in how we could actually like, fulfill the 10 declarations that Ping Dong uh, have outlined. So, how, how do you think we are more ready now compared to 2007 when members of parliament voted not to repeal 377A? I'm asking this because one of the declarations is we are ready to be, the, we are ready to see the change we are to be, right? So, how do you think we are more ready now compared to say when you were a younger baby? Not that young, Yeah, but this is not a young baby. I ran through the field. Uh, but yeah, how are we more ready? I think um, as, as the video showed, right, there are more local companies supporting us and things like that. And uh, I think one thing that I noticed is also the groups of people who are actually attending Big Dot. You see more older people coming, more people bringing their kids, showing that they are you know, starting their education from a young age. So when this kind of changes happen, it does make me believe that we are much more prepared, we are much more ready compared to 10 years ago or like 11 years ago. So. Um, and yeah, more students, like as far as my personal experience, when I go and speak to uni students, like quite a few of them don't even know about the issue. If you start the conversation, even if, like, you know, this is what tolerance is about, right? You can have the differences, but you still accept and live co co here and be together for the peace of the country and things like that. So um, with that being the majority of the mindset of people that I spoke to, it makes me believe that, you know, we are more really as a... Asia. Because I'm quite sure when I was in secondary school, if I go and speak to people, I would have gotten very polarized views and things like that. But now people are more open to discussion, more open to argument. Uh, but yeah, it shows the slightly more open minded nature of people these days. So I believe that shows that we are ready. So, I'll just ask <laughs> So, I, okay, this is my personal opinion, but I do personally feel the country has changed because of being not because of work done by Uga Chaga, Sayumi, all these other LGBT groups that have advocated for acceptance. And I think the, the culture has changed. And being an LGBTQ person is, you're easily accepted. But the question is not about acceptance, actually. The question is about the law. The, how do we affect change in, government, in the government? 
So my question, and I hope it's not a scary question, how do we empower or you know the LGBTQ voters to demand change from the incumbent government? Why aren't we organizing to vote the current government out? And why is equality and LGBTQ rights a voting issue? So these are multiple questions, but I think I can answer once. So maybe uh, Angela, you'll take this. <laughs> Curious too. <laughs> um, there was a survey that the, that the government ran very recently and was published in um, the Business Times. And every every Monday they have a column called Views from the Top, and they ask all the C levels, all the C suites, and all the CEOs and MDs, head of business, um, what is your uh, view on Singapore turning 53 and um, what do you hope the nation can achieve and stuff? The survey was very interesting because one of the one of the one of the data point was around Singaporeans wanting and express a very explicit desire to be um, to have more compassion for and and yeah so compassion rated really very very high amongst them and I have to agree and I think because. Singapore has a lot of other issues and um, we have a lot of foreign talents here and that created a lot of, uh, that disrupted kind of like the way Singaporeans live their lives and you know, that, 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 became, that became quite apparent when they started to vote in certain of the districts and then, you know, then I think they lost two seats yeah, I think they lost two seats as a result of something like that. But those people are, but these affect like the general people. When it comes to LGBTQ issues, I think a lot of people are empathetic. And I personally know a lot of um, members of the community that, that don't even attend Pink Dot. That are like, and, and I had coffee with a recruiter. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> with a recruiter the other day. And she identified as queer, um, you know. And then I spoke to her about my work with Outforce, and I was like, I feel very fortunate to work for a company that allows me to pursue this other passion of mine and to be able to effect change in the community and also within Salesforce. And she's like, Yeah, it's a good company for the WWE or something like that. That's beside the point. Sorry, I digress. <laughs> and she basically, she she, she said. Um, and her partner is transgender as well. And then I said, oh, you know, like, there's a lot more that you guys can do than just be in the background. And she made one from the community and she's like, you know, I don't really care about marriage equality. It doesn't matter to me because I don't need to get married. And I know a lot, and she, she herself said it, a lot of people in her community were are all really passionate about it. They're like, we want to get married one day because I want to have a family too. I want to like, adopt a child. I want to have a, a child to a surrogacy and, and stuff. And she's just not one of them. And I think a lot of people within the community are just not um, that much of a fighter. Um, like, that, that's just my observation. And I mostly identify as straight. And then a lot of people would be like, why are you so passionate about this? And, and this has got nothing to do with my sexuality, but more on what is right and what is wrong. And as a Singaporean, is this the kind of future that you want to see for yourself? And I think people like me need to vote and then influence a little bit more on the people. But, um, but Pink Dog does a very good job at raising that kind of awareness and all that. Um, and the other way is actually to vote me into parliament. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I would vote for you. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's a really great point though, you know, um, whether it's a real joke or a real thing, you know, I think it's a powerful point because I want to just cycle back to your question like, how do we know we're more ready now than before? And then I'll link it to this next question, right? And I will take a very specific example because I work in a church, right? 
And when FCC first started, a lot of people build it as an LGBTQ church, you know, because most of the people who go there are gay or transgender or something, right? Queer. And people say, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, the LGBTQ church, right? It's not what, it's not the identity we wanted to perpetuate, it's just that people kind of, you know, they put that on us. And it was true. Majority of our members were LGBTQ. The interesting thing is, in the past two years, we've seen an increase in straight families dropping out church. And that's, that's been a great thing. You know, and the reason why straight families have been joining our church, bringing their children to church, you know, and saying we want to have Sunday school for our children here, right, we don't want to go elsewhere, is because, it's not because they haven't been going to other churches, it's because they wanted something different. They wanted their children to grow up in an environment where justice, equality, love, compassion, these are things that are real, that is important for them. They want their children to grow up in an environment where immediately, you know, they would not be um, dealing with discrimination of the other, where they actually learn that we are part of and part of each other, you know, and so the same changes there. So when often the government says, you know, Singaporeans are not ready, la. you know, we're not ready for this, at least not the majority. And I think perhaps on a certain level that is true, but without pushing the envelope, without really looking at what's actually going on in our com communities and society, we are actually not seeing what's really coming up. You know, and there are actually a lot of straight um, allies, people who actually want to make a difference. And in answer to your second question, and I was just thinking about this, I think for a long time, a lot of LGBTQ groups have been working very separately from one another. Right? We try to work together, you know, and we try to do common things together. I think that's wonderful. But often we've been really trying very hard, but very separately. I think there is a place for us to come together. And if we want to make this happen, it has to be a united effort. And it has to be not just LGBTQ people, it has to be people like Angela, right? All the straight allies who really believe in doing the right thing. I think we've entered that generation where doing the right thing is a huge thing now. You know, and, and if we can come together to do that, I think that's when we'll start to gain traction. We'll start to really make a difference. I agree. Thanks for that. Very, very, I agree very much. So, good enough. <laughs> So what do you think? I think you, I think you represent the future of advocacy <laughs> work. The future of what you know, the, the work is, the groundwork has already been done by by Pinda, Ubachaga, and all other indignation and all this. What do you think is the next step? I, I we just mentioned things like you know maybe coming together and trying to lobby the government or something. But do you think the young people, the youths, are ready for this? Great challenge. <laughs> okay, interesting that you brought up, uh, you know, coming together and things like that. So basically, for Inter Uni LGBT Network, that's that was our main focus. That is our main focus uh, because you know each individual uni have their own LGBT support groups within them. So the point of Inter Uni LGBT Network was to have an umbrella unit, bring them all together to share the resources to have bigger scale events because if it's one uni they're limited to their own resources and certain unis they're not even recognized as a group they're just a self-run student group so uh, with the limitations of each uni we felt that bringing them together working together would make a bigger change and so far we've been proven right because uh, we are able to run bigger scale events our research advocacy uh, in charge was able to do a lot of uh, great projects that brought a lot of awareness about trans in college and uh, you know bullying in universities and things like that so um, yeah, the focus should be in combining our resources, our forces to fight as one front rather than individual groups. I think that should be the future track to go with. Yes, thank you. All right, let's move on to the next one. Another imagine the future kind of situation. So imagine we have all the rights that we have been in or we want. Imagine you can get married, you can have children, you can marry my boyfriend over here. <laughs> and you know, 377 is repealed. So, what, how can we bridge that divide between us and groups like we are against Big Dog, or Wai Wai, or religion that is completely against LGBT affirming policies, for example? How do you think we can, you know, try to put this together as one? Basically, the idea is if we are polarized and divided in the name of equality, shouldn't then we try to bridge that gap at the end of it? I think the first step is for us to look at things through the lens of intention. 
and where do people's intentions lie and how do they approach certain things when you have a group like you're against Pink Dot or We're White your intention is to spread gospel about this other group of people and spreading hate and even, you know, creating and saying a lot of bad things that are not true. Um, so you, us as individuals, as sentient beings and, and, and critical uh, adults, you need to look at things with a critical lens and look at people's intentions. And when, so yeah, without repeating myself. But then, um, then there's no divide. Like what I said earlier, change is uncomfortable and there will always be people who stand on both sides. I remind myself every day that there are people who support Trump every day. There are people who still think that whatever that he's doing is right and all that. But as individuals with you know, a critical thinking, you get to decide and then you get to decide what is right, what is wrong, and what is, where, where do your values lie and align. That would be my answer to the question. But I actually have um, actually a question for Polly about this question. <laughs> um, and it covers a broader issue, is that I have actually encountered um, this pastor from a church before, and he has, and then I asked him, he asked me to go to church, I was like, no. Uh, and, but then I asked him, is your church uh, accepting of the LGBTQ community? And he said, yes, God knows them all. But someone alerted me and educated me on their front, and not all accepting churches are the same. So actually, I want to get Paul to clarify that point. Thank you for the question. <laughs> and I'm not sure that's a question that's on a lot of people's minds as well. Um, but I, just before I address the question, I wanted to address your question as well about engaging, right? Um, because I think we have a very vocal minority, right? So I would say um, we are against Pink Dot, Black White. I would call them a very vocal minority, people who speak very loudly. Um, I don't think they represent the majority of a lot of religious people, actually. At least in my conversations with people, I would say that a lot of religious people are actually quite moderate. And in fact, a lot of them are thinking about, they're kind of on the fence and they're trying to figure out this whole issue. Where do I stand on this? How do I understand this? How do, what does the Bible, what does the Quran, what does all the spiritual and religious texts, what do you say about it? You know, and how do we deal with this in a loving way? All right, so I, I would say the conversation goes deeper and there's value in continuing that, those kind of conversations. So going back to that question that Angela asked, you know, there is a difference. Right. And I say this as a Christian, I say this as a pastor. Uh, most churches will say they are welcoming and accepting of LGBTQ people at all. Because I know of many Christians like that, very loving. Right? But the underlying message is, there's something wrong with you. Then I'll tell them, there's something wrong with all of us. Huh? Huh? We're all broken in some way. Huh? Not just LGBTQ people. Huh? All of us are broken in some way. We need each other right, to make sense of things. We need each other to walk this journey better to walk a genuine life better, but not because you're LGBTQ and you are especially damaged as Thanks for that. So right now, I would like to open questions to the audience. So if anyone has anything? I hear the shout, first don't know why. Introduce yourself as a can. So the question is, do you think politicians, especially Singaporeans and MD and all this lah, like, do they have responsibility to fight for LGBTQ rights or equality in general? Tiffany answered the question for herself. It's like, no, if, you don't, if, <laughs> if you don't in fact change on the inside, 
then there's very little, there's very little uh, people like people like you, people like you can do when the law doesn't change. And politicians should absolutely have to make us have should absolutely be very affirming and. Um, it is, it is part of their responsibility. Sorry, I'm not articulating much. That's very well. It is part of their responsibility. And if you look at, and if you look at, um, if you model it after other countries, um, everything, everything has to happen from that level. When Taiwan managed to legalize same-sex marriage, when Australia managed to legalize same-sex marriage, there are a lot of politicians who will always be like, no, they're not ready, and and there are a lot of fight and a lot of resistance towards that. But then eventually, it is still politics that got the change that they wanted. And Singapore, it would have to be the same. So if you are putting your vote, if you're, the elections is coming, and this is something that we have to ask our government. Um, we are not the minority anymore. And you have to ask them, what are you doing for me? And it is not just about the GST and the electricity tariffs and the water tariffs. It is also about whether I am recognized as an equal individual in this society. You have to ask them that. It's like we say the pledge every day, uh, the children, but what are we teaching them when you, when you shield certain things away from them? And um, so we have to be the one questioning our government. Um, we have to be the one holding our government accountable. Uh, for what we want to see, if we are truly ready, which I think we are, then we have to be that voice and, and ask them. Yeah, so basically the idea is, you get the government you deserve. If you want your government to do something for you, you have to demand it, right? Opposition, the same. When opposition parties do their rallies and stuff, we have to ask them the same thing. You have to ask your, your, nom your nominated parliament, you have to ask your NMP, you have to ask them, well, when are we repealing this law? Um, do I get to marry my partner? Um, does someone coming in from overseas, what if my partner comes from overseas? Will they get a visa here? Will they, will they get citizenship here? I mean, those are a bit far, but we're imagining a future where that happens, and I really think, as a Singaporean, I really think that will happen. Probably, I don't know if I can live long enough to see it, but I really think that will happen. And that can only be because people like Vivek and people like you, Tiffany, you need to you need to be standing in there and asking your your MPs and your and and your Prime Minister actually. You got Facebook now. <laughs> Shall I? Yeah, I'm trying to shout. Uh, my name is Sir uh, Chi. My follow-up question to that is why I asked uh, Steve uh, Tiffany. Uh, it has to do with electoral politics as well. Your answer is terrific answer. I think all of us as private citizens should actually be asking our representatives, our parliamentary representatives, our representatives as to how they're going about representing us. I wonder though, uh, what do you think uh, of the potential for LGBTQ and their allies to organize in such a way as to help pro-LGBTQ rights or LGBTQ leaning members of both PAP and the opposition parties uh, to actually help them in their uh, campaign, in their... Uh, it's not just a matter of getting into power, but also a matter of you know, getting into a position of power within their own party to make changes, to influence others below them. What is that potential, you think, in this current situation for us to organize, to influence intra party <laughs> I think that's a very interesting question. And recently there was this whole opposition coming together to form a coalition, right? So if you look up north in our neighbours, Malaysia, uh, they have very interesting dialogue going on about LGBT rights. And that's happening only because UMNO was removed, right? Because now there's space to actually talk about this openly. And I think, I'm not, I'm not suggesting here to us to rally and like, you know, go get arrested and like, get whatever. But the idea is, is, is right. It's not about like politicking, but it's the politics of it. It's like can LGBT groups start becoming more political and maybe work with opposition party, maybe make 
gay rights or LGBT rights an issue versus just like, you know, the government is raising on GST. We are panicking right now. So maybe this is a question that the effect should answer. <laughs> because you are the future. That's the future. <laughs> um, I, I can definitely see limitations in groups coming together because, uh, as I say, you know, even university groups, some of them are not even recognized. So if for uh, unrecognized team to suddenly start talking politics and stuff like that, that is a repercussion that the group has to be willing to face, which might be very hard. Um, also, uh, yeah, it's also, you know, as much as people are willing to support the cause behind the screen, like behind the scene, how many people are willing to put themselves out there? Putting yourself out there is really going to get a real lot of attention. You know, it's like half the time when I'm even talking about asking my friends to join to join my inter-union to be the network and things like that. If you're also pro uh, the cause, why not come and support things like that? It's like, oh, what if my picture is taken and put out there? Uh, if in the future I go for interview government jobs, will they accept me or not and things like that? So there is that fear factor. So it's, it's I think there are a lot of factors that play into it that we would have to overcome for them to come together to take over a political issue because in Singapore, you know, like, you start talking about politics, it's very easy for them to do whatever is needed to silence you. So, uh, you know, I, I guess baby steps is as sad as it is to say what we can take right now. As far as I can see, you know, um, moving slowly, radical movement, it's a, you can either achieve very well or you might lose whatever you have right now. So some people might be up for it, but I would, at least for me personally, I'd be taking baby steps slowly, building up to it. Be a safe option for me, I guess. So, yeah. so, when it comes to like politics, right? I think Singapore has always remained kind of, well, not kind of, very neutral in ASEAN. So they don't want to offend people. Uh, that's why we hosted someone like Trump came here. That is the reason. And we're a very neutral party. And when it comes to international relations and international affairs, we're friends with everyone. And that's how, and we're, we're a small nation with very limited resources. Um, and that's how the Singapore government kind of positions itself and not invite war from our neighboring countries. See, I speak for the government. Um, so that idea, that potential, I think is there. And I love that idea. And there's obviously a lot of obstacles that you need to, need to, need to consider. But I think at a geopolitical level, I think I'm not a politics expert, but I think Singapore also will worry about what Malaysia is thinking in Indonesia where people are caning people for being gay. If we take a very strong stance on something, um, then that has an impact. I'm not saying that should be that shouldn't be the reason why we do certain things or not do certain things, but probably probably at a, at a MHA level, they probably are thinking about uh, geopolitical issues and not getting Singapore in, into some of those things. And, and that's where I think Singapore lies in that, in that position. But, um, but having, having I, I look forward to that future where um, there's a few groups, where there are a few groups um, that can come together and be a voice for all of us in the community. Any more questions? Yeah, I want to mention something that's connected to Gidong's question in which we live with political parties because uh, when people like us, uh, the first year of the state group in Singapore, try to reach out to political organizations, we had a very good relationship with the Singapore Democratic Party. And the only politician to attend an education event was Yes. He was very vocal when he attended the uh, invitation events in the late 2000s and he stood up and spoke up about LGBT rights. But during the previous election, the results that the SDP got was so low that all the statements supporting LGBT equality were taken off on the website. So that is a step backwards as a result of the dismal results which they got in the election. So it's not that easy. There's a lot more work to be done and even the large scale surveys done by the uh, Institute of Policy Studies show that no matter how you phrase, no matter how uh, usually you phrase the surveys in which you ask, uh, are you, you a 
two or three seven seven A D material or it will start to uh, review the MTA itself and it still stands that about seventy percent of Singaporeans do not uh, support the repeal of three seven seven A. So the reality speaks for itself, so even though we try to imagine that things have changed a lot, but off the ground, the general survey shows that we have actually changed very little. Then my question would be, um, do we continue to go with the majority, what the, what the majority wants, or do we, do, we, do we fight for a future where Singapore can be better, where Singapore can experience the kind of disruption that a lot of the companies are going through by rewiring the way we think about equality? And, um, and, and to me, it is, more about, it is more about the future generation. What do I want for the future generation? Um, do the 70% of these people are... Do they care? Do you all know what happened to Brexit? Everybody knows what happened to Brexit? The reason why we have a Brexit is because a very small percentage of the people made a decision that are based on ignorance and all that and caused a whole country to be exited from the European Union that has a lot of economic issues and has a lot of uh, political impact, um, money impact is going to affect the pound. Um, we don't want that for our, for, for our future. Um, actually, it's not a very small percentage, it's a big percentage because that actually caused Great Britain, Great Britain to, be, to be exited from, from, yes, true, yes, from, the, from, from the EU. And, um, and the reason why that happened is because there's this very a uh, big group of people who are in the age group of I don't know 60 and above, and they were they were they were <coughs> disenchanted, and they have a very wrong view about what is right and also what is good for the future. And I would argue that this 70 percent that are being surveyed um, do not represent what the future of Singapore should be. So, do you agree? <laughs> I agree. Alright, so there's no more questions over here. Anyone? Okay, go. Cool. Tolerate them, they don't accept them. 
So my question is, um, how worried should we be uh, with regard to movements like true love is? I think that's for you, but... Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I, mean, I think that that is a, a thing that's probably on a lot of people's minds. Because true love is a new campaign that just came out about the same time as Pink Dot, uh, coincidentally. Um, and uh, I think the question about tolerance and acceptance, right? Now, what I was about, uh, you know, we were discussing about this earlier on, right? and uh, there, there are two things about, I think, true love is uh, that I wanted to say, to talk about. One is that I know people, right, who are in some of the true love is videos, I've talked with them, I understand where they're coming from. So when I say people come from good intentions of love and wanting, you know, to make a change in some way, you know, I, 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 I sincerely know that. Mm -hmm. um, my concern though is that with the messaging of something like true love is, which is a little bit ambiguous, right, uh, it's very loving, very welcoming, right? If you first, you know, go to the website, go to the videos, like, oh mom, you know, even some of the pastors actually apologize, right, for their how they've treated LGBTQ people. I think that's like, wow, you know, it's touching. I think underlying it is, if you look at us on the stories that come out, the common narrative is that there's something inherently wrong with you. Either you were abused as a child, or you know, there was something that went on, um, and then at the end, you know, something needed to change, right? And then you say, ah, I'm healed. Right, in some way. And I, I think what I, I'm concerned about is how long does this messaging um, sit with people who are struggling? And I think about especially young people who may be Christian, LGBTQ, they're trying to figure things out for themselves. Right? And they may think, oh, maybe this is the answer. Right? Because this sounds quite loving, it sounds quite welcoming. Um, and then you know, they get kind of involved in it and they realize that, oh, wait a minute. And I know that true love is will tell you this is not conversion therapy, yeah? I have talked with them about this. They said, no, this is not conversion therapy. And by the by the technical definition of it, it is not conversion therapy. In a way. But you will see that ultimately what they are actually asking of us, or people who are LGBTQ and who are struggling, is that something needs to change in you. And that is how you live your so-called lifestyle, right? And, 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 and so, um, one of the ways I feel to really understand the intentions of the group, you know, and, and, and in truth is, would be to look at their list of resources. Right? If you look at their list of proper resources, you'll see that a lot of it is, um, it would be considered quite fundamentalist, it would be considered also, some of the research articles that they put there uh, are also things that have been debunked over time. So, I think we need to be careful how we look at it. But I'm an optimist as well, right? I'm an optimist because I believe that where the church is in Singapore, where the conversations about LGBTQ issues have been, it's either been kind of swept under the or every time it's brought up, it's always been very negative, right, for a long time. What True Love is, is endeavouring to do, that I hope at least is one step forward, is at least opening up the conversations within churches at large. At least instead of, you know the, the, the term that churches sometimes like to use, right? Love the sinner, hate the sin, right? You know, for a long time, it's always been that hate sin was a lot louder, right? In, in the narrative, in the way that, you know, has been put across. I think for a like true of this, what's happening is the love the sinner, hate the sin part. The hate the sin part has turn a little bit more to a, to a softer tone and what they're trying to achieve is love the sinner, uh, let's try to listen and understand a little bit more and maybe the hate the sin is still there. Lah. Let's try to do something about the sin part. Okay. It's not, it's not um, the perfect solution but I'm hoping that that at least advances the conversation the one step forward. Right? It pulls at least churches and Christians at least one step forward and say, okay, at least let me listen to your story. Now, the power of listening to stories, the power of us standing up and sharing our stories, I don't think we can underestimate the power. Right? When we talk about seeing change, right? 
Often, political parties, different people, they're worried because they say, oh, the majority are still very, you know, against, and we, we don't want to block the vote, right? You know, when the difference between tolerance and acceptance, how I've seen things change, and I come from a Christian perspective, I'm sure for all of you, you've seen it in your families and in your own religions as well, in your own religious groups. How I've seen things change from tolerance to possibly moving towards acceptance is when somebody knows someone else in their lives who is LGBTQ. It changes the conversation for them. It's no longer us and them, those people who are trying to do all these things, because, oh no, it's my best friend, it's my daughter, it's my uncle, it's my brother, it's my cousin. It's different. Right? And I know that because when I came out to other Christian friends, people that I, I knew for a long time, a lot of them were shocked. Because they were like, what? You're gay? Okay. It's like, oh no, it blew their minds. It's like, oh no, now we, now we don't know what to do with like, all this information because what we thought we knew of gay people, uh, you kind of break the stereotypes and I don't know how people begin to make sense of this. But that's when conversations happen, real conversations start to happen. It's no longer, you know, theoretical, it's no longer, you know, I think this is right, this is wrong, this is sin, this is not. It's talking about another human being. It's talking about love. It's talking about people wanting to fall in love, wanting to be with the person they love, wanting to make a life with somebody they love. What does that mean? If you know this person, if this person is your son or your daughter, what does that mean? You know, and it forces people to grapple with the issue on a much deeper level, on a real level. I don't know. We have to answer. So let me just wrap up the conversation. <coughs> so I agree. And the very reason I started as a generative is because I truly believe that story, individual stories of people can change societies. Like empathy and connection with one another. Not just through personal relationships, but showing that I accept you and you accept me. It can actually change a lot of things. So that, that is why this conversation cannot end here in this room. It has to go on. So I'll, I'll just circle back to my favorite author for the moment, Tui Nguyen, again. So she ended this book beautifully. She said, now that you know what inequality looks like, now what? Now we have to refuse. So right now all we have to do is the act, is anytime you see inequality, you just refuse. Because we have just imagined a future of what equality looks like. And then we have to strive for that. So it might be through political, through, it might be through stories, it might be through businesses, future <laughs> and it might be true anything that we do but now that we know what equality is and the potential for equality in Singapore we have to start acting on it and I think let's end on that thank you everyone